Blessings, dear friends. Greetings of Jesus. This is your friend Jacob Fash speaking to you at the moment from the UK. You know, so many of the questions we get in our Roku broadcast and on our Vimeo clips and on YouTube deal with subjects that we deal with much more extensively in our books. We can't, for the sake of brevity, uh, go into the kind of depth in a TV broadcast we can actually go into in a book. But so many of the questions come from material that are expounded in the books on a much more broader scale that it's almost frustrating sometimes that we can't spend hours and hours answering a, a, the questions that, that are given to us. Obviously, practicality dictates that's not a possibility. The books are there. They're available. They're available in print, the Moriel catalog on the Moriel website, moriel.org. But in this day of Kindle and electronic books, they're also available through Amazon and they're available through Kindle. Kindle. The three books that would be the most referred to in the questions we receive are the three latest books. The first being The Dilemma of Laodicea. The Dilemma of Laodicea is an exposition of the seven churches in Revelation, culminating with the final two churches, Philadelphia and Laodicea particularly, setting the stage for the return of Jesus. The Dilemma of Laodicea would be the first. The second would be Shadows of the Beast. Shadows of the Beast. How the coming Antichrist, how his identity will be revealed to the faithful church. The rapture will not happen, will not happen, absolutely not happen, until the faithful church knows who the ultimate beast of revelation is. That is the Antichrist and also the false prophet. How the identity of the coming Antichrist will be revealed to the faithful church Shadows of the Beast, the second book. And the final and latest one, Harpezo. Harpezo, what the scripture actually teaches about the rapture, the snatching away which takes place between the sixth and seventh seals in the book of Revelation. So these three books, The Blum of Laodicea, Shadows of the Beast, and Harpezo, all available on the Morial catalog, all available through Amazon, and all easily available electronically by Kendall. Thank you so much, dear friends. God bless, and Jesus be with you. My views of Charles Spurgeon are similarly very, very high. Uh, known as the Prince of Preachers, he basically pioneered the concept of the linear presentation of the three-point sermon, etc. Mr. Spurgeon would preach daily, sometimes multiple times to 6,000 people in a sermon at Elephant and Castle in London at the Metropolitan Tabernacle. Unfortunately, that building was destroyed by the Luftwaffe in the Blitz, but the facade still stands. There's another building there bearing the same name and the occupant of what is claimed to be Spurgeon's pulpit is there now, Peter Masters. Peter Masters, however, is a cessationist and he is a hyper-Calvinist. He does not believe all of the things that Charles Spurgeon believed. In fact, there's a misrepresentation of Charles Spurgeon going on in 
Metropolitan Tabernacle in London to this moment. As one example, Charles Spurgeon believed in the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews. His eschatology encompassed a prophetic belief for Israel and the Jews in the Lord's dealing with Israel. Uh, Peter Masters is a radical, radical replacementist. He's a supersessionist. He denies the prophetic purposes of God for Israel and the Jews. He departs fundamentally from the views of, of Charles Spurgeon, even though he claims to stand in Spurgeon's pulpit. Now, this is not the only place in London this has happened. Uh, R.T. Kendall did the same thing, standing in the pulpit of Martin Lloyd-Jones, but radically departed not only from some of the doctrines, but even the specific caveats, warnings expressed by Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones at Westminster Chapel. Uh, R.T. Kendall wrecked havoc of, of, of that fellowship, unfortunately, with his involvement with the homosexual alcoholic Paul Kane the Kansas City false prophets, etc., his endorsement of the Toronto uh, deception, and so forth. Nonetheless, let's go back to Mr. Spurgeon. Everyone quotes him. Well, let's remember also about Mr. Spurgeon. Mr. Spurgeon was not pre-tribulational. He was not pre-tribulational. That's swept under the rug. He was not a replacementist. That's often swept under the rug. People are selective in their citations and quotations of Mr. Spurgeon. Now let's deal with the Calvinistic issue. Mr. Spurgeon would pray, O Lord, save thy elect, and please elect some more. I can live with that version or that interpretation of Calvinism, even though I'm not a Calvinist. O Lord, please elect some more. Charles Spurgeon was attacked in his day attacked by extreme Calvinists. He was attacked by them. He was even falsely accused of having Wesleyan and Armenian leanings. Not that that would have been wrong in my book, but he was accused of it. Mr. Spurgeon uh, was not a radical Calvinist. He was a moderate one. What happened to him was not unlike what transpired to the founder of Baptist Missions, William Carey. When William Carey proposed to the Baptist Convention that missionaries be sent to Asian countries, he was told by the hyper-Calvinists to sit down and be quiet. If the Lord decides by his sovereign grace to elect the heathen, he will do so without your help or mine. This war against mission, against evangelism, by hyper-Calvinists, they actually had a war against missions and evangelism. They actually did because of their perverted doctrine of election and to the degree to which they took it which Spurgeon did not subscribe to. He was a moderate Calvinist attacked by the more extreme ones. I'd also point out something else about Charles Spurgeon, much, and I emphasize very much to his credit. He knew people who were in the early Brethren movement, among the early dispensationalists. We would have to say that in a broad sense, Mr. Spurgeon was dispensational himself. He knew James Grant, he knew others the contemporaries of John Nelson Darby. Thankfully, Mr. Spurgeon took out full page ads in newspapers in the UK and in London and in the UK, publicly warning about the deceptions and dangers of the despotic false teacher, John Nelson Darby, the hyper dispensationalist. He warned about Darby, the chief architect of pre-trib although his main arguments were not about pre-trib contra Mr. Darby. It was his hyper-dispensational twisting, distortion, maligning of scripture out of all reasonable context. Let's remember that Darby would teach, and those who subscribe to Darby's followings, and uh, or followers of Darby today who subscribe to following what he propagated, Darby essentially said the Sermon on the Mount was not for Christians. It was only for unbelieving Israel. The epistle of James is not part of the New Testament. It's not for the church. It's only for unbelieving Israel. And he did the same thing with the Olivet Discourse. The whole pre-trib distortion of Matthew 24 is based on Darby's saying this is not for the church. The same as Darby said the epistle of James is not for the church or the Sermon on the Mount is not for the church. Charles Spurgeon publicly stood up and went against John Nelson Darby. 
as did some of the early Plymouth brethren who knew Darby, such as Dr. Samuel Tregalis and others, and uh, Benjamin Newton. Well, thank God for Charles Spurgeon. He was not afraid to stand up and by name publicly warn against a false teacher who was misleading the church named of John Nelson Darby. I thank God for the legacy and the heritage of Charles Spurgeon. I certainly agreed with him on most things, and even the areas where we disagreed, we did not fully disagree. If there's anybody's sermons worth reading, it's the sermons of Charles Spurgeon. I only wish that those who so frequently cite him and quote him today would have spent more time reading his sermons and dealing with him comprehensively instead of selectively. I would also point out in conclusion that over 100 years ago, Charles Spurgeon warned, he warned what would become of the Baptist Union in the UK. And everything he warned that would become of the Baptist Union in the UK has happened to the Baptist Union in the UK. It's an ecumenical quagmire. But I would also recall that brilliantly, I believe by divine inspiration, Charles Spurgeon foresaw coming what has happened. He foresaw what would take place with people like Bill Johnson and John Arnott and Mike Bickle. He said, long before Benny Hinn was born, long before Kenneth Copeland was born, Charles Spurgeon predicted a time would come when in the pulpit, instead of having shepherds feeding the sheep, we would have clowns entertaining the goats. Boy, was he correct. Thank you so much for your question. My name is Jacob Prash. God bless.